globally and in india there's a lot of talk happening about the environment yet some aspects which are crucial to this conversation currently seem missing like caste class language gender adivasis the youth and questions of environmental justice not only are these themes missing those who can represent these issues in possibly the most apt way are missing too and it's not because they don't have anything to say it's because a lot of us are not listening so in an attempt to alter this we present to you blind spot it will bring on this platform women and a few men from dalit obc adivasi communities and countries of global south i'm arpita kodiveri a postdoctoral researcher at nyu law and i'm vaishnavi rathor environment lead at the bastion and this is blind spot One of the most dynamic debates in the environment space is between proponents of wildlife conservation and proponents of human rights. The two camps, so to say, have often been head to head against each other, resulting in not just different models of conservation, but even court cases. So to begin with, we try to understand a little bit on why these points of view end up becoming two extreme points of view with a hard middle ground to find wildlife conservation and the laws that were enacted and the way they were enacted they have often been in conflict with the or they have a history where where you know the communities and the wildlife conservation efforts have often been pitted against each other so wildlife itself might not be the uh you know seen antipathically you know in an in an objective sense the conservation effort especially those led by the government that is the state led conservation effort they had a history of marginalization or you could say a history of conflict between the communities and the government uh, you know which has the forest department as its face uh, in such matters so you know that sort of boils over and that uh, antipathy towards the department boils over and spills into um, antipathy towards conservation and that sometimes becomes antipathy towards wildlife but perhaps people and wildlife are not independent of each other after all as alfonso points out protecting biodiversity rights is protecting human rights when you look at human rights and human right to development and biodiversity con- uh, conservation maybe that's where a, a little bit of uh, conflict is at but like i said also i think what one needs to kind of uh, look at is these um, people who are di- directly dependent on um, bio resources or biodiversity and when you're protecting biodiversity you're protecting the livelihood of people who are dependent on the biodiversity that way uh, you have a lot of you know one can look at biodiversity conservation as a human right conservation also just like alfonza raza too believes that a larger biodiversity approach or an ecosystem approach is necessary while working on conservation a lot of times what i see a problem with uh, rights group is that and and this is very interesting because this is something exactly what the forest department does on the other side is that they you know they they see tree protection and equate it with ecological you know protection of the ecology or the protection of the um, uh, biodiversity of that area which is not the case you could have trees being protected individual trees being protected but say if all the palatable grasses are extracted out the, that will have a uh, effect on the ecology of that landscape and that will in turn effect, effect the biodiversity of the area when you when you talk of the question of uh, wildlife this is very important you know wildlife has certain ecological needs from an ecosystem uh, you could have densest of you know tree cover in an area as as happens with say even forest plantations that are done across india and yet if there isn't enough diversity of of habitat diversity of floral species all of those things if, if there isn't enough of that the wildlife will not thrive in that area so how can the two camps find a middle ground for alfonza one strategy is to involve people more directly under the biodiversity act i i really think that with respect to indian biodiversity law 
uh, it needs to be a little more decentralized it is it, in, in spirit there is a lot of decentralization that's the only or one of the few environmental central uh, uh, legislations which have decentralized provisions it mentions very specifically about the role of a committee that is constituted by the local self governments that is a panchayat or a corporation or a municipality they can constitute a committee for biodiversity management it's called the biodiversity management committee so uh, even though there are uh, maybe like you know some kind of community involvement in the biodiversity act and the biodiversity process it's not uh, a very common thing right like for instance uh, the biodiversity act says that okay someone is using the bio resources that person is getting a lot of profit out of it or you know commercializing it this commercialization whatever you are getting it has to flow back to the community from where either the community has knowledge or the community who is living uh, is the one providing that bio resources right but there's no mechanism to ensure that okay whether the consent of these communities are obtained you know where uh, when someone is using the bio resources or the traditional knowledge it's there in the law it's said in the law but these mechanisms are not elaborated what i hope is i hope the national biodiversity uh, authority the state biodiversity boards will have at least uh, some model benefit sharing uh, agreements where the community involvement is there where communities are negotiating talking about her work around hornbill conservation in arunachal pradesh aprajita then shows how people can indeed be important stakeholders for wildlife conservation you know what happened is in 2010 when we analyzed our data we had been collecting hornbill nesting data there's been a lot of deforestation that happened in the border areas between assam and arunachal right and especially the assam side in shonitpur district it's very well do- documented more than 300 400 square kilometers was uh, deforested it was all great hornbill habitat right hornbills nested in those lowland forest um i wanted to emulate what you know dr pillai kunswad in thailand she had done this for hornbills in uh, southern thailand the hornbill nest adoption program in where they work with um, people in southern thailand who are of a different community who used to poach uh, chicks of hornbills from nests right and uh, so she uh, struck up you know got this idea of getting citizens to sort of support and adopt hornbill nests instead of a uh, you know like applying getting a grant to do this kind of then we started noticing that all the nests that we knew outside in the arunachal side also were not usually successful either they were being abandoned or disturbed or getting cut down whereas the nests in the park were all okay you know there was no um, human disturbance so we thought that we should do something to protect the habitat outside because hornbills move widely over both areas right and the park is 862 square kilometers whereas the outside areas are 1000 plus and those were with the territorial division reserve forest right so we, i spoke to tana dapi who was the officer um, and then this gorabe society people some of them were people i knew from before uh, from my days as a phd researcher they were all the gamburas who were hunters before and i spoke to them whether they'd be interested in doing something like this you know like finding hornbill nests which we would then sort of protect through this program and i would arrange and get support from outside to pay for people to act as the nest guardians right so they agreed so the first year was like a pilot year in 2011 when they just found some nests in the breeding season and we gave them an honor honorarium three of them then we launched the program more formally and officially sort of in november 2011 and the nest protectors started uh, and they were selected by the gorabe society from different villages after dialogue sorry i'm giving such a long answer but then yeah they were all like there's some 10 different villages around the southeastern boundary so the idea was they would be in charge in their area they would find the hornbill nests 
and they would be in charge of looking after those nests and protecting the surrounding habitat right and they would be supported by the forest department uh, people if you know they found any problem and the gorabi society and ncf's role was to sort of give them more technical training um in how to do all this and also in terms of providing with the getting the salaries money for them as well as the equip like you know equipment for them so what's heartwarming is that there are a lot of advocates among the community now it's not us you know outside people who you know like our nest protectors are like role models for a lot of people they also come into conflict with many people because of trying to stop illegal logging but they are they've also won some awards the uh, sanctuary asia found as well as you know they've got recognition for what they do continuing aprajita also emphasizes on the need to find a common ground in this debate one of the things that really worries me and it's sort of very disheartening and disturbing at times though not always is this endless debate between um i don't know how to uh, put the terminologies but you know social scientists or say anthropologists versus the what is perceived as the more hardcore wildlife uh, conservation research lobby and i and many of my colleagues i think in ncf are in the middle somewhere and we find it extremely hard because i i can see that point of view i can see this point of view but at the same time i don't agree with either of them fully either because i think people uh, get into the polemics and to yelling and shouting at each other and deliberately misunderstanding each other whereas not seeing the common ground as well as not seeing the nuances because there's a lot of place based context in many issues you know and you cannot just uh, simplify them and binaries you know there's a lot of division especially among wildlife biologists related to the fra there's wildlife biologists especially a lot of the younger people thankfully who believe that the fra is a good instrument for whereas there's some you know people who i respect as wildlife biologists and researchers who have a very different view uh and i cannot understand why they are so opposed winding up this conversation raza two pushes for a better understanding that the two groups need to have about each other both both, both the sides have to you know try i know it is easier said than done for uh, a lot of us but uh, you have to try putting aside your dogma and ideologies and see facts for as they are 